Alright gang, so I'd like to welcome you out to yet another on-air PD. Um, this one is going to be about building engineering into your, into your classroom. And I've got two guests that I am really excited for you guys to meet today. Uh, the first one is Lloyd Hilger. He's over at um, Hanover Horton Middle School. He teaches middle school science. And Lyman Robertson is teaching Project Lead the Way over at uh, Vandercook Lake. So before I introduce these two characters, what I want to do is just kind of give you guys uh, some background about why we chose this topic. Now this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, before I came over here to the ISD, I taught for 10 years in middle school and high school science. Um, uh, eight of those years I was over at Michigan Center High School teaching chemistry, physics, and engineering. And I and this is my opinion. I think that engineering really ties together science and, and math. It makes it meaningful. It makes it relevant for our kids. The problem that we're running into and that I'm hearing so often is that engineering is this very intimidating word that if we're if we're a math or a science teacher, that somehow this is this is just something that's way too big, and it can be kind of daunting. What I want to show you today is that it's not. Uh, Lyman and Lloyd are doing amazing things in their classrooms, and what I'm hoping you can do is kind of take a listen to what they're talking about and just figure out, okay, how could I tweak this to work for for my situation? So let let me introduce you to these guys. Uh, I first met Lyman because I was teaching Project Lead the Way over at Michigan Center and he was teaching it over at Vandercook and it became very obvious very fast that this guy knew exactly what he was talking about and that he was having a great time in his class and really pushing his kids to do things that they they hadn't done before but I'll tell you uh, if you walk into to Lyman's classroom and you're a tinkerer, if you like to build things, you are going to be in heaven because you are going to see projects all over the place. You're going to see, you're just going to want to sit down and you're going to want to play. And I think that is an awesome thing for an engineering, uh, an engineering class. But the most important thing that I notice whenever I go into his classroom is he has a bunch of kids that are just working their tails off who are who are uh, engaged and really diving deep into some pretty serious projects. So really excited for him to be here. Now Lloyd is a legend around Jackson County and the, and the state of Michigan. Um, I first met him when I started teaching at Michigan Center High School and I was over at the Michigan Science Teachers Association Conference and I went into this uh, into this session. It was on ways to use vernier uh, probes and I found out really fast that this was not going to be one of those sit and get type sessions. Lloyd had us up move around. We were measuring the temperature of different heights on in the room. We were playing around with tin foil and copper sulfate. We were doing all sorts. Of, we were doing anything but listening. We we were doing. And as he was talking about his classroom, I thought, you know what? This is this is exactly what I want my science classroom to be like. So, Lyman Lloyd. I am very excited to introduce uh, the rest of Jackson County and the state of Michigan to you guys. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your, your busy schedules to, to be here with us today. You guys are both coming from engineering in your classroom from, from slightly different angles. Lyman, you're teaching uh, classes that are completely dedicated to engineering and that emphasize the math, math and science principles. Uh, Lloyd, you're teaching the science classes and using the engineering projects to kind of tie in those concepts that you're talking about. What I'm hoping here, and, and Lyman, this, this first question will be for you. What is it that intrigues you most about engineering in your classroom? Uh, the most intriguing thing for me is seeing the kids who thought engineering was going to be something that was too difficult, that they couldn't handle, that um, it, it's actually something that was easier for them. They were scared by it. Those first few weeks they thought they were going to be overwhelmed and they were going to fail. Um, but to see them actually engage and see that light bulb come on like, oh wow, I can do this, you know. Um, it's not just what they've heard by word of mouth from their friends, but when you actually see that, that light bulb click on, that, that's, the, that's the part that keeps me doing it. Lyman, tell us a little bit about Project Lead the Way. What, what would it look like if a teacher were to walk into your classroom? Hopefully not too chaotic. Um, the students work off of laptops. All of the curriculum is generated from the national organization, Project Lead the Way. 
Um, so they're all in front of their laptops. The PowerPoints are accessible if they need to get them at home or if they need to check things back out in the classroom. But for the most part, what they would see at first is you know, us starting the class, looking over what the, you know, the objectives are going to be for the particular assignment, and then it's going to be small group work if it's going to be my principles of engineering class, which is more of the hands-on building and uh, calculating efficiencies, more of what you think engineering to be, or if it's my IED class, the intro to engineering design, that class is going to be individuals working by themselves using Autodesk Inventor, which is a 3D modeling software. So I kind of have that side of the engineering that most people don't see or the actual building of structures and, and, and uh, more computer uh, programming type of things. Nice. So they're really kind of getting a feel for what it's like to, to be an engineer. So Lloyd, here, here's a question for you. you like I said, you're, you're going at engineering from a slightly different angle in your science classes. What is it that intrigues you most about engineering in the classroom? Well, first of all, I had a real awakening this past the past two summers when I was working up at Michigan Tech uh, in a project called Wood to Wheels and we were working directly with the chemical, genetic, and automotive engineers finding ways to convert wood into ethanol and then use that as a product. I sat in on some of the chemical engineering grad students meetings and two out of seven were from the United States and I said man we have really got to do something but engineering in Hanover started really at the sixth grade level. Uh, we have students doing what they call the Rube Goldberg project where small teams work together in a three-team project to make something push up a flag and kids just love it and uh, with the projects we do in my classroom they it just lights a fuse but I also work at the career end of what's engineering careers looking at misconceptions that students have and I do that within my uh, computer class which is now seventh grade computers and seventh grade engineering. So tell us a little bit more about that. How did you set up your your engineering class? Well what's happening right now we've, I've got a new group of, of students for this nine weeks and we're first starting oh. with um, basically what it is engineering and we do a pretest and when I first did the pretest, students were thinking the engineer was the guy that drove the train. And when they leave, they're looking at, oh, there's at least 12 engineering careers. And I'm having them look at ways to uh, put together a PowerPoint of their favorite career. And then there are other, other days when we're not using the computer, we're coming down to my classroom to make and design, say, paper rockets that are powered by... Uh, uh, Two liter pop bottles for air, and we look at where in the engineering design process loop are we at through this entire step-by-step uh, -step sequence. I also incorporate some some computer skills in that they have to make a PowerPoint, they have to make a brochure, they need to do some things that are computer applications, but with that engineering and career career backup. Give us a little. Uh a little kind of look into that project. What is it that you were asking them to do with the paper rockets? We want to have them come up with a... Well, first, we're introducing criterion constraints, which at the middle school is something we want to look at. And one thing I've looked at recently is that entire engineering process from kindergarten through 12th grade. And uh, kindergarten, let's look at problems that people want to change. Third, uh, fifth grade, let's formalize problem solving. And then sixth, eighth grade, sharpening the focus with criteria and constraints. So I give them a criteria. These are the constraints. And then we go and make our rockets, test our rockets, and then redesign them. And then it's, all right, let's write this up and look at where we are in the, this engineering design process. We do the same with uh, balloon zip lines. That because the idea is the balloon travels the zip line in the longest period of time and we have a really nice uh, lesson plan on the uh, Michigan Tech website in the Sustainable uh, Futures Institute that they can just look at and go here are the teachers lesson plans. Nice. So Lyman tell us a little bit about what's your favorite project in uh, Project Lead the Way? I've got two new ones I just jotted down thanks to Lloyd. Um, 
Am I IED class? I think the the best one is early in the year. It's a puzzle cube. Um, some call them soma cubes as well, but it's meant to be a child's toy. Uh, the the design challenge, the design brief is that there's a furniture company that has extra wood left over from their manufacturing process, and instead of scrapping it all, they're looking for something to do with it. So they want to create a puzzle cube so that when the families are in there looking for furniture, the children need something to do, they want to have these puzzle cubes around the store so that the kids can be entertained and out of their parents' hair. So what my students have to do is create on paper, they do some sketches, and they come up with two different solutions for a five-piece puzzle. And it's a three by three by three. It's like a Rubik's Cube, but instead of twisting and turning, it's five pieces that come apart and has to be put back together. So they have to, on paper, come up with ideas. And the first thing they have to do is they take the linking cubes back from elementary days and they try to figure out how many different combinations can I make with three small little wooden cubes. And how many can I make out of four or five? So they kind of have an idea. It's kind of like their own little Tetris game. And once they come up with those combinations and they have to design two solutions and they choose which one they think is best, then we get to go on the computer and use Autodesk Inventor and create them as 3D models. And then assemble it and they get to learn how to do animations of how the puzzle comes apart and goes back together. They create a package for it, a company name, um, and they have to, you know, keep in mind the constraints like Lloyd talked about, that these are for children, that pieces can't be too small, there's choking hazards, um, how much would it cost to create the package or ship the package, so on and so forth. So they get kind of a, an all-encompassing view of all the different areas in manufacturing and engineering that, um, that one might encounter. And if we're lucky, I get to send one of the files over to our career center and have them make it on the 3D printer as well. So we can kind of have a solid version instead of having all the small three-quarter inch wooden cubes all glued together because one of the things they find out right off the bat using the dial calipers is there's no two blocks that are exactly three-quarters of an inch. Um, some of them, even though they're made by the same machine, are, are quite a distance off. Nice. So, so what I like about both of these examples that, that you guys have given us is that these aren't necessarily things that work perfectly in a nice 30-minute period. That not only are, are kids going to really have to go through the whole process, but they're going to learn that it doesn't always work out the exact say, or it doesn't always work out perfectly the first time. And that it might take a little bit of redesigning. It might take a little bit of kind of rethinking things. Um, and and that's that can be hard for some kids. So here's what I'm wondering, Lyman, you or actually Lloyd, you've you've really pushed your kids in your class, but they've had a good time doing it. How have your kids responded to that rigor in the classroom? They with the engineering stuff, we don't have to push them on. Uh, Example is the sixth grade project. We have kids saying, can we work through lunch? We have parents coming in to help out with the project. I mean, they just get excited about it. And I think it's a matter of, of presentation and what they're doing. They just enjoy it. And uh, Lyman, I think you and I had similar experiences in our Project Lead the Way courses. I was finding that a lot of kids who hadn't had success in a typical math class or a science class were all of a sudden having successes in those engineering classes. What have you seen with your kids when you've really tried to, to push them to do things they might not have done before? Uh, yeah, I, I have seen those successes. You, it's billed as a class for kids who excel in math and science. So right off the bat, there are kids who think they can't take it. But if they come in and chit-chat with me and I kind of talk to them about what are their dislikes about math or science, I can kind of get where is it that they've been stuck? And I can kind of encourage them and say, hey, while you didn't like doing area, surface area, or volume, things like that, you didn't like the formulas, let me tell you how we use them in here. And we talk about that puzzle cube and how, you know, once they do the measurements of that, and they see that they can hold on to something, and they get a chance to paint it. And we can talk about surface area and how much. Now it's got a practical application, which is what they were missing in their math class. All they were thinking about was the chapter test and the chapter review and the exam and the post test and those kinds of things. Now they're thinking, I get to make something. It's, it's my creation. It's not a problem in the textbook. It's a challenge. And, and they rise to a challenge more than they do the chapter review. 
isn't isn't that amazing how some hands-on stuff will really make that much more engaging for them? So now, Lloyd, you've got you've kind of developed something over there at Hanover Horton Middle School. It's almost a, a rite of passage over there for the science program, where you take uh, your kids on a little trip. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing over there with with your uh, with your trip? Well, this will be the our 16th year. I'm sure my wife will tell me I'm wrong. Uh, in which we're going up to Wilderness State Park and Mackinac Island, and the first day is Science Day, and it's really Science and Math Day, and we start at U of M Biological Station, we get a full tour, and then we go over to Wilderness State Park, and we do uh, four investigations. How does the water quality compare at seven different sites in terms of temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, acidity? What does the glacial boulder weigh? Uh, how does the inflow stream volume compare with the outflow stream vol volume? And how does biodiversity compare camp and at school? And uh, two of them really are math questions. What, what is the boulder way? We know the density of the material. We need to figure out what the volume of this big, huge baked potato that came from uh, Ingodine on the, in the UP, what, what's its actual volume? And it's actually a sphere cut in half with a cylinder laying on it on its side. And then in terms of inflow outflow, we need to find the volume of a quote box of water that moves into the uh, pond and moves out of the pond in, in another stream. And for that we need to measure the depth in five places, the uh, width of the stream, and the length of the run, and then we use a, a highly technical device called an orange that we have float down the stream so we can measure its uh, speed. And this is a stream that's got a lot of uh, silt in it. It's actually clean water, but it's got about a foot and a half of just bluch. And I used to go in with leaky waders, and I would send the orange down the stream. I've now got a robot that's an underwater robot that was sent to me that we're hoping to have it go out instead of me to uh, launch the orange. And I think that's going to be pretty pretty cool. So, uh, and then uh, and then it's cabin camping, subway dinner, uh, and then over to Mackinac Island. So you've got to talk more about the ROV. What's how did that happen? And will it have waders? <laughs> <laughs> I will have my good waders along in case. Well, I'm an online mentor for new science teachers nationwide, and I'm also right now. Uh, mentoring in the explorations of engineering's and as a result of that the they uh, found me they said do you want this ROV what do you teach and why do you want to use it and at first I thought I want this because it's going to be really cool and then I started coming up with the idea of the orange float and maybe it can go out and do the water collection and stuff like that and most of that was funded by the people who manufacture the robot Ninety-five dollars of that was funded by donors choose, and it all just kind of worked out. And the boxes are coming in as we speak. Nice. And now, now just so everybody knows, Lloyd was telling me he's kind of nervous because one box that came in today was just tools that you need to put that together. So you always know fun's going to happen when you have a whole box just of tools. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> all right. So, so in his voice. Tell me. Tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you guys have run into. Lyman, how, what have been some of the, the tricky parts that, that you've run into trying to get this, uh, this program up and running for you? Um, budget is always a concern uh, every year with the struggles that each district has. You know, my budget's cut year after year. So the consumables are, are you know, kind of the hard part. One of our um, Fisher Technics kits for our principles of engineering class is around three thousand dollars for the kit the pieces the software so on so forth um, we had some funding up front for that but once pieces break or come up missing or an interface that's like three hundred dollars is damaged then you have to start taking those those smaller groups and you have to they have to be bigger you have to have fewer groups now so the challenges become a little different with the management of the projects. Um, but having a computer lab that I teach these classes out of, the challenges also 
um, mess, <laughs> not having the, the right equipment. You know, we're we're working on Rube Goldberg projects right now, Lloyd. I, I'd like to hear that other people are doing it too. Um, so right now having, you know, the carpets and the sawdust and toothpicks everywhere and sawdust shavings, uh, that's, you know, it's the mess, but uh, cuts and drilling and stuff like that. I, th I think those are the, the bigger challenges is your budget and, and making sure you have the right equipment to do the stuff. If you can do with other things, the kid's excitement is going to make up for not having some of the stuff, but those would be the challenges. Nice. Now, how about you, Lloyd? What kind of challenges have, have you run into as you've tried to get your project or your program up and running? Uh, funding is always an issue and time. Uh, last year we were trying to fit the engineering into our uh, into my seventh grade science class and at the same time add the making ethanol out of wood project out of Michigan Tech and frankly I just ran out of, out of time to get everything done so we moved that over to the computer class and it, and it solved that very nicely. Also when I first started looking at engineering it was tough to find resources. Now it, it's, it's, there's just awesome stuff out there. It's, it's exploded. Nice. And in fact that, that's like the perfect segue because um, one of the comments, Adam, thanks for, for joining us man, but uh, he said he's trying to find resources for his physical science class, especially the, the chemistry portion. Where do you guys go for just ideas and resources of, of any kind? Well, one that I've started using that has tons and tons of activities, and I'm just starting to wade through it because there's so much there, is a site called Discover Engineering. And it's got just tons of activities from kindergarten on. And it's, it's awesome. And I showed a, a clip out of that uh, in which students were going to a uh, skateboard shoe designing factory. And it got kids really excited about what engineers are really like. Uh, the CEO was skateboarding from office to office and, and just really lit, really lit a fuse. How about you, Lyman? What, where do you go for ideas or resources? A uh, little different with me. Most of my stuff is canned curriculum. Um, but the Project Lead the Way things, we've got 180 some days where the curriculum somehow people in New York thought we could pack into 176 day school year over here. Um, so I you know the resources they give are, are really good with the PowerPoints and the Word documents and most of those contain links already in them. Um, you know depending if it's my my younger kids the Ed Head site for simple machines and things like that those are good sites. You know a little cartoony so it's still kinda engages them a little bit. Um. Now here's here's one more question that, that I have for you. Uh, what, what would you suggest to a teacher who wants to start finding ways to build engineering into their curriculum but isn't quite sure where to start? Lloyd, what would you suggest? Well, I've, I've got a few ideas on that. One is the Michigan Science Teacher uh, Association Conference at the beginning of March is next gen and engineering really is the theme of the conference and that would be just a, a great thing to attend. That'll be up in Lansing and uh, our sixth grade teacher and myself we are, we're running a couple sessions there together. Uh, also I'm starting to run uh, sessions at schools after school. I could even come in and run workshops and then the one website I would say is to go to discover engineering and uh, that has just lots and lots of great, great, great resources from both engineering careers to engineering activities and so on. And then PBS has a design squad that also has a lot of, uh, of great engineering uh, things for kindergarten on up. So that's what I'm thinking. How about, how about you, Lyman? What, what would you suggest for a teacher who's just looking for ways to get started? Um, the ITEA website used to have quite a lot of stuff. NASA will also have some academic things in there depending if you want to do water rockets or balloon rockets things like that depending on what part of science or math you're looking to involve engineering in. Um, the ITEA site does have a little bit of both with the science and math. You know and just just going in and typing in STEM um, for all sorts of things are going to bring up bring up a lot of a lot of good places. 
Well, Lyman, Lloyd, you guys have been fantastic. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to, to come talk to us. Um, so thanks for the ideas, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about how to get other teachers around Jackson and Michigan going on this. Excellent. You're very welcome. Thank you.